Live. Well, hello and welcome. I'm Wendy Rose Williams, and I am an energy healer. I help people release chronic pain, anxiety, depression, and other things that might just be stuck in their field and are just stopping you from enjoying life, being able to feel healthy and happy, and that you can live your purpose. My website is wendyrosewilliams.com and so happy to welcome you to the Waking Up Spiritually podcast with my co-host, Greg Kirk, and I'll turn it over to Greg to introduce himself and introduce today's topic. Thank you for being here. Hi, everybody. I'm Greg Kirk. I am an energy worker and I run uh, a number of things. I run a Lyme disease clinic in Connecticut. I also do online group healing circles every Sunday. Uh, one Saturday a month, we do a fire circle here in Connecticut. I also do um, remote energy sessions and in-person sessions. So if you are interested in anything I say or anything, um, or if you would like an energy session, please contact me through my website at gregkirk.com. That's spelled G-R-E-G-G-K-I-R-K.com and click the appointment request uh, link. So today, Wendy and I felt it was a good time to talk about the topic of discernment. And as I'm getting that ready, I'm going to um, ah, gonna try to share my screen here. We'll let Greg do that. While he's doing that, please uh, visit our website, which is wakingupspiritually.com. You'll find over 50 archived episodes there, and they're wonderfully labeled and you'll also be able to see the PowerPoints. So certainly you might be joining us as a podcast and just able to listen in, but you're also welcome to uh, look from the website or our YouTube channel and be able to uh, see uh, the PowerPoints and the uh, information that way too. And my website is my full name, wendyrosewilliams.com. Again, thank you and welcome. And let's jump into uh, discernment. First, let me just kind of set this, the table on this, and why are we talking about discernment now? Well, we live in an age of information, I would say of hyper-information, where we are able to access files, digital files from the Library of Congress, from all over the world in an in instant. You know, the, never in any point in history have we been able to do this. Um, and lately, over the past few years, there's been um, concern about things called misinformation or disinformation, or just the other day I heard malinformation, mm. <laughs> information that can harm you. <laughs> so, um, again, you got to use your discernment to see to, 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 how does that feel? Uh, do you think there's any information that you could find out that would actually harm you? That doesn't sound right to me, but maybe it sounds right to some other people. Anyway, the idea here is discernment needs to come in. If, if, these are some turbulent waters to navigate. You know, if you're navigating, if you run across something, especially in the digital world that is considered misinformation or disinformation, or even this new term, malinformation, what if you read it and you think, Actually, yeah, this doesn't sound so crazy to me. <laughs> or, you know, what, what do you do then? So that's, this is what we're uh, walking through today. Um, dialing things all the way back to using your intuition, using your common sense, and weighing that against some facts. So let's, let's get into that now. So let's talk about what technically is discernment. It is the ability to understand and comprehend information and experiences in a non-judgmental way that's open to the influx of new information at all times. You know, the scientific method is something where an idea or a theorem must be tested independently and then agreed upon um, by other people studying it. And it needs to be open to forms of information that might be outside the mode. So in other words, if you're studying a topic or if you're studying an experiment of any kind and you're getting similar pieces of information, but every now and then you get some outlying information. And sometimes we see the situation where people ignore that outlying information and they they don't call it's it just skewed your results. <laughs> exactly. It makes it very inconvenient for the people you know, doing these, these tests. 
But, you know, let's face it, you know, we, Wendy and I started this group because I would say when people are waking up spiritually, the experiences and the information you're getting is that outlier information, <laughs> right? It's not the norm. I, you know, wouldn't you agree, Wendy? Um, that's a great way to put it. Absolutely. Yeah. And right. that's what we're, that's what part of what we're here for with this group. And also you can visit and join us in our Facebook group, which is also called Waking Up Spiritually. And we are to try and help reassure you and try and help make that journey to waking up spiritually be more comfortable and to help normalize some very uh, outlier, out of the box type right. experience. Right, but but also to to have an open discussion that's non judgmental and that's respectful. Like we just had one the other day. I shared some bits of information about I don't remember what the topic was, but um, you know it had to do with past lives or ghosts or something, <laughs> right? And uh, I shared the information, and one of the people in our group said, "This is very interesting." I don't believe in it, but that's okay, <laughs> you know, and that's how you do it, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> you know, that's, that's beautiful. That's how it's done, right. Mm -hmm. So anyway, um, yes, so true, I'm, I'm skipping ahead here, but so true discernment is a combination of the heart and mind, your intuition and your mental assessment of facts and experiences. Now, typically in Western culture, um, especially in the scientific community, Discernment is really seen some, as something as a binary intellectual mental assessment based upon established, agreed upon facts. And now, you know, like Wendy and I just talked about earlier, this makes it a lot easier to get some work done <laughs> if you have these, these, these constants, as they're called in the um, mathematical and the scientific world. If you have a set of constants, um, you can always you can hang your hat on those. You can build theories off of these these pillars of agreed upon fact. The problem is there is a man named Rupert Sheldrake who is a scientist. He came out with a TED talk a while ago that was actually banned by TED talks afterwards. And basically, this is what he he found out. He found out that um, the speed of light, as we know it, changes. It's not a constant and that it can be measured and that there are certain labs around the world that measure the speed of light. So he went to a friend of his who works at one of these labs and he, and he said, what do you do about this? You've noticed the speed of light fluctuates and changes every year. And the, his friend, the scientist said, I know that was really upsetting us and making our lives a lot easier, but we solved the problem. And Rupert said, well, what did you do? We made it a constant. <laughs> we, it, what was magic wand waving <laughs> right. with all so due now, respect <laughs> because of this lab the speed of light is always you know this, this certain speed and hey you know they can do all their calculations a lot easier and build theories off of that and he and rupert said that's the most unscientific thing and this is what we need to avoid this is very unscientific and he equated it he called this uh, dogmatic thinking, scientism, and he said it's really nothing more than it's very parallel to fundamental religion. <laughs> so the the science becomes a religion to people, you know, and it's it's very locked to thinking, and it's not very open minded, and um, a lot of people believe in it. So then that gives it legitimacy, and then there's no uh, creative thinking outside of that. So that's what we need, I believe, is the um, is what is at risk <laughs> when you're looking at facts and when you're if you um, start to believe in a set of thoughts and they become your beliefs and then they become part of your identity, that makes it very difficult and even uncomfortable for you to change your mind about things. And it's, it's, I would say from an energetic standpoint, it's not good for you because then if somebody attacks or, or not even attacks, just questions your thoughts, you take it personally that they're questioning you and what right. you're all about. So it's you so want to interwoven then with the identity, yes. like our, our job or our occupation in Western society, we can overly identify with that. Yes. So um, Wayne Dyer had a great, uh, quote. I, I don't know if it, 
I think it was his, you know, he came up with it. His recommendation was to keep an, a mind open to everything, but attached to nothing. Um, and I think that is the guiding principle when you're looking at information. Keep your mind open to everything, but attached to nothing. So if somebody mentions a set of thoughts to you or a set of facts, whatever it, it is, and they um, kind of brush against your belief system, see if you can see if you can accept it anyway. <laughs> see if you can not get mad about it. See if you can not get defensive about it. Keep your mind open. Maybe there's something that can actually turn your belief system over. I think it's a healthy pursuit to have your belief system churned and uh, turned upside down every few years. I, I'm actually one of those weird people. I, I, I enjoy it. <laughs> so I, I know I'm a weirdo, but there's a lot of people where it's, it's very upsetting. Um, so anyway, but here's, here's some other kind of um, standard uh standards to, to think about when you're looking at information. The, the truth does not mind being questioned. However, a lie does not like being challenged. So that's another thing. So if, if, if there's a, a fact, great quote, right, if there's a fact, and so that's what we're getting, we're getting into a world of kind of strange types of censorship now, especially in, in social media, where if you can't even talk about a subject, um, m why, <laughs> you know, open discourse especially respectful discourse should be, you know, shines the light on all facts. And, you know, they, they always say that light is the best disinfectant. If, if you try to close down a discussion, um, there's usually, I would say, you, you should question that, <laughs> you know, not just question the facts you were questioning, question why somebody doesn't want you to talk about it. So, and then, uh, Edgar Allan Poe has, has a great quote, believe nothing of what you hear and only half of what you see. <laughs> so let's you're move making on. Me, you're making oh. me think, Greg, of why so many classic amazing books like To Kill a Mockingbird are banned huh. and why they're banned in certain school districts or certain states and I more embrace, I don't know who said um, this quote, but said, a truly great library has something in it to offend everybody. <laughs> right, yes. Because I think we're talking about shaking up belief systems. And I think what you said about the heart being really a key piece of this, because we can't think our way through this. Right. Uh, we just really that that heart, that intuition, just that that knowing within your body, because the body's so wise, is part of our discernment package. You know, you just you just feel in your body if you're aligned with something, or if no, that's not for me. And I love how you talked about not not judging it or condoning it. It's just it's not for you. It's just that simple. Right. Right. You know, when I see something that I don't believe in, um, I keep an open mind to, to it that maybe later on I, I will, I'll find some other facts that, that help me to understand it or believe in it. Because there have been things like that in my life, you know, things like, you know, when I started getting into healing, people talked about crystals. And I thought, oh, you know, that's, that's not for me. It doesn't seem like something that's important to me. It seems a little too woo-woo for me until I had in interactions with, you know, I, I, you know, typically my situations, the belief churning things for me have been through experience. Direct experience. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I think a long time ago, we were talking about supernatural experiences um, in one of our broadcasts. And I had a, a girl I dated who said that she didn't believe in ghosts, but she saw one. <laughs> she had an experience. with. How do you reconcile those two things? <laughs> yeah, that doesn't make sense to me. I mean, that that's, even after her experience with a ghost, she still had a closed mind about them. So that's that's pretty. That's like mental gymnastics to to keep your mind closed after that. But to me, um, when you have an experience with something, and that's another thing, you know. So when somebody says something about, well, let's just talk about something like UFOs. That are it's a pretty open topic. So whether you know whatever you think about UFOs, when you talk to somebody who's seen one, and you can see by the look on their face and the sincerity in their voice, 
or, you know, especially if you listen to the details of any story, they tell you about it. And if it seems true to you, you and so you're listening with your brain and your heart at the same at the same time. That's a great way to discern whether or not it's true or not. And there may be aspects, even still, of what they tell you that are still hard to digest. Right. May, maybe the maybe just the overall gestalt of it was okay. I think this person did see the UFO, but some of the details of the story are, are a little hard to believe or understand, but I could right. tell by the energy coming from the person that they were that sincere. They, they believe really it and they had the experience. Right, right. And right. What, what you said about the belly is so important because to me, it's not just the mind and the heart. It's that solar plexus. It's that gut wisdom because you just, you know, you just put your hands there and that's where a lot of us feel our deepest truth. Some of us feel it with the hand over the heart or it can be the combination. And right. yes, certainly we're running it through our, our logic and our, our good, our good brains. But I think it's linking all three of those, those parts of us. Completely agree. And it shouldn't be just one or the other. So, you know, the scientists will say, oh, you're talking from your gut or your heart, and they might be a little, be, be little you. Whereas somebody who is whatever, not less of a scientist and more of an intuitive or an empath will say, you're using, you're too top heavy with this information. You're, you're only giving me facts. They, they feel cold and, and, and unenergetic. And I, I don't believe them either. I, you got you to combine all of these things. You got to use your head, you know, listen to the logic, read the logic of what information is coming in. And then how does it feel? How does it sit with you? So let's move on here. So let's talk about the importance of unpolluted information. Because so this is less of experience let's just kind of distinguish a little bit about what we're talking about we're talking about facts that are either read or described to you or broadcast to you or you would read them or okay well you would see them in movies and you would read them in books and so forth um this is less so much about experiences um so <sighs> The, uh, your, your ability for discernment is to try to distinguish between the chaff and the grain. In other words, good, good information versus some that might be false. So um, Albert Einstein says, facts are to the mind what food is to the body. So, you know, obviously, if you're uh, digesting junk, <laughs> you know, like crappy shows on TV or whatever, you know, that's that's not that's not rich food that is full of, you know, true and positive information. Also, th this is funny, this is coming from a comedian, Ricky Gervais, but this is one of the, the best um, quotes that I came across when it came to discernment. Opinions don't affect facts, but facts should affect opinions if you're rational. So that's, that's a great way to put it. <laughs> that is a great way to put it. And, and just to understand that a lot, of, that I, unfortunately, I think a lot of the news channels today are putting opinions on top of facts versus letting the facts speak for themselves. I mean, we're going to talk about this a little, little later about how broadcast uh, news and information has changed over the past 10, 20, 30 years. But back in the old days, in the 1960s and 70s, um, literally Walter, Con Walter Cronkite <laughs> would report the news and he would give no opinion. And a lot of times they would say at the end of these shows, you decide, you know, so it, they would let you decide. Encouraging critical thinking, encouraging discernment. What a concept. That's fantastic. Today, you, this is all being digested for you. <laughs> and the, the opinion comes out first, and you're kind of persuaded to think about what news story just happened in a, in a particular way, which is very manipulative. It feels very manipulative to me. So, um, Well, that's bias. That's, that's, that's a slant. Exactly, exactly. And, and to, to that um, idea, Aldous Huxley says that facts do not cease to exist because they are ignored. Now, that's another thing. So this is, yeah. so only giving the facts, kind of cherry picking the facts to present a bias is, is a way to pollute information. Even though if the information might be true, if you're ignoring a certain set of the, the full story, it's going to distort your overall information. Um, 
And Maya Angelou says, there's a world of difference between truth and facts. Facts can be obscured. So facts are just data points. And truth is the overall reality of you know, what all these facts add up to be. I thought that was a good distinction. And this makes, of course, this is a, a quote from Frederick Nietzsche. Of course, he would say this. <laughs> there are no facts, only interpretations. <laughs> and that's kind of like what we're getting today in the news cycles. There are facts, but you know they're being spun and interpreted in many different ways. And then just a final one as a joke. Uh, this comes from Homer Sim Simpson. Statistics can be used to prove anything. 14% of people know that. <laughs> <laughs> So, and then, and then there's, a, there's actually a famous one by Richard Nixon when uh, he was being skewered about uh, the Watergate hearings uh, and the uh, reporters were grilling him and throwing facts at him. And he said, quit confusing me with the facts. <laughs> it, was, it was messing up his, uh, his ability to try to distort them and bend them to his will. The spin, the story. Exactly. The, the narrative that was developed. Exactly. So let's move on and talk about some reality of what is happening today. So these are actual events. You can look these up. Um, I found a lot of these for, on Wikipedia. You can find most anything uh, about what, what's been going on in the United States since 1934. So uh, in, in regards to um, inf broadcasted information. So the Telecommunications Act of 1934 created the FCC, the Federal Communications Commission. Uh, it, they created it as a governing body, and the idea was to keep the information that was reported out to the American public as pure. This is going into the idea of trying to keep information unpolluted, and we'll see things have got, kind of turned upside down. So this Telecommunications Act was created in 1934, the idea being just to um, set a, a set of rules to um, to keep the information from being distorted. And the Telecommunications Act of 1996 deregulated this. And um, they, they stopped regulating information and under the guise of fairness and they to let anyone enter a communications business. So there, at, at that point, you had to have a license and you, you had to be a legitimate news source. Today, th they thought that, that wasn't fair. <laughs> but now it's, it's, it's opened uh, the, the playing field to the wolves, I, I, would, I would say. And the results of the more recent act have facilitated the monopoly of communications companies. They're, you know, back in 1934, and up to 1996, there were only 50 controlling corporations prior to the act. Today, there are six companies that currently control, listen to this, all content in television and film, print, music, internet, radio, video games, and communications equipment. That's, that's six companies. That's sobering. And think how much larger the population is. Yeah, because you know, those that, companies affect the world, not just the United right, States. Yeah. Right. So that's, um, you know, this is one of those things where this Telecommunications Act was deregulated in, in the guise of fairness and to try to keep it open. And it did exactly the opposite. It went from 50 companies down to six. It created an um, yeah, unintended created consequence. A, yes, it seems. Yeah. So let's talk about another act that occurred in 1948. It's called the Smith-Mund Act of 1948. It prohibited the domestic creation of materials. Basically, we could call it what it is, propaganda by the U.S. government for public dissemination. So this Smith-Mund Act of 1948 said, hey, we want a free media. I mean, that's one of the one of the pillars of that the United States was 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 built a upon democracy, a free and independent media. So they basically said, we're, we're going to make this act that, you know, the U.S. government cannot do anything, cannot give information to all the broadcast networks. And that was overturned. 
well, <laughs> it was called the Smith Mund Modernization Act of 2012. But for all intents and purposes, it allowed the, for the materials produced by the State Department and the Broadcasting Board of Governors, the BBG, to be disseminated, widely spread within the United States. So in 2012, our government started um, openly giving our news media information, propaganda. I don't know how many people know that, but I, I used to be in the, in the That's news. That's mind media. blowing. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and when you understand that, you know, think what you want about, you know, Elon Musk and the whole Twitter thing going on right now. But one thing that came to light during all of that was I found out that there was like two or three people on the board of directors of Twitter prior to Elon Musk com coming in who were former CIA employees. <laughs> How, to, you know, what? <laughs> that was interesting. You know, forget about the you know, the din and, and the, all the fuss going on over that situation. It was interesting to find out that there were some CIA employees as a part of Twitter. And I think there are also in, in Facebook. So um, that's, that can't be ignored. Those are facts. <laughs> Those are true facts that, that might be outlier, but they, they make the, up the whole picture. And then finally, there's this. In 1949, the FCC developed what was called the Fairness Doctrine. And those of us old enough to remember news broadcasts back in the, 60s, the 70s and 80s, remember that they used to have a rule on television radio called equal time. You may remember this, Wendy, where somebody would give an opinion on a news show and then there would have to be, they would, they would call for equal time. So the reason I remember this so well, there was a, um, an episode of All in the Family and Archie Bunker watched somebody talk about gun control. And he said, well, I want equal time. So I'm going to go on and talk about gun control or the, or the opposite of gun control. And his idea was he, he they were worried about um, hijacking back then. All the planes would get hijacked and sent to Cuba. And he was upset that this hijacker did that. And he said, well, you just gave guns to every single person in the cabin. Nobody would <laughs> be fine. There's an Archie solution for you. <laughs> exactly. Um, and, uh, you know, so he called for equal time. So that's how I remember that. Anyway, so this was developed in 1949. And um, so every, you know, radio station, every TV station, whenever an opinion came out, this was only when, because up to that point, they were broadcasting news and not giving any opinions, but they would have like an opinion, you know, segment, and then they would have to give the opposing view within a certain matter of time. I, in my in my opinion, <laughs> that was pretty good, but they it's they, like point and counterpoint, exactly. which I think was the name of a program, even. I believe so. I believe so. So, um, isn't it interesting that um, supposedly Congress and the FCC got complaints that this wasn't fair and this was suppressing people's free speech somehow, and that the doctrine was abolished in 1987 under the guise of fairness and that the old doctrine infringed on people's freedom of speech. So now that's gone. So, and that opened the door more or less. I mean, within years of that, we started having the different broadcasting channels, you know, things like Fox News and MSNBC, and they all spun off. And, and now whatever your belief system, you just go watch that channel and it's just catering to your <laughs> beliefs. So is that part of what took it from the big three of ABC and CBS and NBC, and it then it then just opened that door? I believe so, and I believe the idea of uh, infotainment <laughs> infotainment uh, came out around that I time. That, that concept of yeah, there's news, but it's got to be entertaining. Entertaining. It's you know if it bleeds, it leads, and or, or all these different um, argument shows like Morton Downey Jr. and <laughs> you know. Uh, and please, Geraldo. listeners, you know, chi chime in. You're welcome to put comments. We don't we don't pretend to know everything. We do our best to research and listen to our guides as we're presenting. But please, you know, share share facts with us. Share what you think. Right. I I admit. So I'm I'm trying to be as factual as possible with all this. And I'm sure there's going to be some people who will hear this and think, Oh, Greg doesn't know what he's talking about. Well, these are facts, but I mean. You, they kind of poke at some belief systems, I think. But you know, I I um, I was a journalist I, when I came out of college. I, I was in the news media, 
And I'll just, you know, to be honest with you, through my experience, things have changed a lot since I, I was a hard newspaper reporter. And um, the, back in the old days, you used to have to give at least, if you uh, quoted somebody, and, and especially if you reported things as fact, you had to have two independent sources. That, that meant- Corroboration. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Two completely different people who, with no skin in the game, or maybe one, you know, skin in the game on either side, so you give a balanced view. You, that's that's how you re- report, but this is not happening anymore. And I'm shocked, you know, some bastions of of respected news, you know, um, are being turned upside down with their facts lately. I think it's because the news cycle is so rapid now. Mm. Back in the old days, well, yes, because you look at the 24 right. seven nature. At Bruce Springsteen, do you remember his song, 57 Channels and Nothing On? Uh, yeah, right, <laughs> right. <laughs> because there's just so much, uh, you know, competition of trying to fill up that vast, I, I, I think it really changed things. It changed the pressures for, yeah. for reporting and for creating content, I think is what we're saying. Well, yeah, a number of things happened. First was CNN came. I don't remember when that was somewhere in the in the 90s where the 24 hour news cycle started, because back in the old days, it would you at least had a day <laughs> to get your story together. Well, the peacock the used to put you to bed at night. You know, if right, you're a night exactly. owl and you stayed up, the peacock would go off and the TV was done for the night. Right. My and the kids rep- can't relate to that. No. <laughs> And the reporters could, you know, have a full day or half a day at least to get their stories together and get all their interviews and everything, and all their facts straight. But you know, with the twenty-four hour uh, news cycle, cha- that changed that, and then of course the internet changed everything because the news cycle was just—it's with you know minutes now. Um, er- you know, everything's changing, and and there's a lot of you know situations where these. You know all the the major bastions of you know, all the old newspapers, and um, they have websites now, so they're reporting rapidly. You know they're not waiting, and they're not on a twenty four hour cycle. And a lot of their stuff is going up without being corroborated too well. And you know, so you, you end up, you know, for the the speed of a news story, and to try to get a scoop, you're getting half, you know, half truths and think or just complete fabrications, unfortunately, and. A lot of times they'll get out there and then um, they're seen as truth and it, it affects a lot of people. So that's that's why we're doing this broadcast hence, today. Hence the need for discernment because the reality has changed so profoundly. I mean, we just we just couldn't imagine this when we were born, that things oh. would change so much in the last few decades. So that leads us to our next slide. Thankfully. A smart guy named Carl Sagan came up with something he called a baloney detector. <laughs> In his book, The Demon Haunted World, um, he there's a chapter called The Baloney Detector. I think he probably wanted to call it something else, but uh, <laughs> it starts the B- with a the B. BS meter. <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> um, but let me rattle through a couple of these and Wendy, you know, chime in as you, you know, as I, I, I knock these out. But um, Understanding something that, uh, well, I'll, I'll get to it. Um, you know, Carl Sagan was a scientist. So he, he does have, even though he's trying to be um, fair, he, he's got a even he's got a little bias, but I, I'll talk about that in a second. Anyway, so number one, wherever possible, there must be independent, conver- independent confirmation of the facts. That's exactly what I just talked about. Old news reporting was you need to have at least two independent corroborations of a fact. And and Carl Sagan agrees, of course. You know, that that's how you know it's true. If, if it's not just one person saying, I saw that UFO, <laughs> you know, or whatever you want you want to say, uh, you, you know, like there's uh, there's an entire town in Phoenix that saw these lights. And uh, th- this is a famous thing, I don't know, in the early 2000s of the, called the Phoenix Lights. So when you've got an entire town corroborating this phenomenon, then that's maybe that was something going on. Okay, number two, encourage substantive debate on the evidence by knowledgeable proponents of all views. Have a debate, talk about it, especially somebody who's got um, some knowledge of the facts that are being talked about or has had experiences even better of of what is uh, the topic of discussion. And 
anybody, I just say this, anybody who doesn't want that, they, doesn't that smell to you <laughs> like fishy? Doesn't that smell fishy? If anybody doesn't want to have an open debate about something, it's because there's something to hide, or I think that there's they've got something you know invested. In other words, it, it might be that their their identity is an tied agenda. That's the kind of stuff I see a lot on Facebook. If somebody's pushing some ideas out, and people say, "Well, I haven't had that experience," and then they get attacked. It, it's that thing I was talking about earlier. If if you t if you tie up your belief system with your identity, then and somebody questioning you is going to feel like they're questioning who you are as a person. And that's, that's not good for you. So um, arguments from authority carry little weight. Authorities, quote unquote, have made mistakes in the past. So I like that. You know, just because somebody is a, an authority on a, on a subject or a topic doesn't mean they know all. And I think this goes for politicians. <laughs> this goes for people in news media, people who are scientists, people in the medical community, people, whatever. It's um, everybody's on a level playing field when it comes to facts. So just because somebody has a learned degree or something like that, they may know, they may have gone to school and that's great, but facts are facts and they need to be able to stand in the light of day by themselves. So I like that he called out that just because somebody's an authority doesn't mean uh, you should just uh, bow down and accept wholesale what they're saying. Um, here's <clears throat> number four, spin more than one hypothesis. If there's something to be explained, think of all the different ways in which it could be explained. So that's just a good idea to think about all different aspects of what's going on with whatever you're, you're looking at. and um, and give the other side a chance. You know, if, if you've kind of landed in a certain way on what you think, be open-minded. Think about, really try to think about what the other guy is saying, right? Really, really do that. That's, that's how a, that's how a level-headed evolved person works, <laughs> you know, just. Well, that's how you get to better solutions because it's just, it's just raising the level. And then of course, if you've really got that healthy discourse going, uh, brainstorming, whatever you want to call it, that can mm -hmm. just give rise to new solutions that neither of you thought of that may be a hybrid or, you know, or maybe just truly different than either of you had thought of so far. Right. This one, we, we, the next one, number five, we've talked about before, but try not to get overly attached to a hypothesis just because it's yours. Yeah. I mean, that's, <laughs> of course, um, you, you may really be into it. <laughs> you may be passionate about it, but be careful about that because one thing. Well, I'll, that's I'll that say, ego involvement, as you yeah, said. Yeah. Just, the just other thing is it turns belief. people off. It turns people off. If you're really coming in hard with your hypothesis, with your belief, and you just won't accept, you won't even let other people speak. Um, that people don't want to hear that. They, they, the world is flat, Greg. I told you the world <laughs> is flat. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> People, and you know, it's, well, whatever, we can get into ways to try to, you know, get your point across to people, but, you know, being kind <laughs> always works, you know, it, does, it doesn't work when you're, you're um, being a jerk and you're just trying to pave over somebody. So here's the one I want to talk about. I think this is interesting, and this is coming from a scientist, and he says, quantify, and I agree that when possible, quantify. What does that mean? It means if whatever it is you're explaining has some measure some numerical quantity attached to it, you'll be much better able to discriminate among competing hypotheses. So in other words, um, if uh, you're talking about, let's say climate change, well, let's look at rainfall around the world. You know, let's look at weather patterns. And these are things that are quantifiable, you know, so we could, that's- What does the data show us? Exactly. Now, that's great in certain situations. However, so I've, I'm gonna go down a minor rabbit hole in this. There's two ways to look at information. Quant, quantify, a qu quantitative, which is numeric, mathematical, and qualitative. Qualitative is, how does it feel? <laughs> and not too many scientists like that. And why? 
It goes all the way back to Galileo. Galileo developed this idea that scientists should eliminate qualitative uh, information, that it should all be quantitative. Interesting. <laughs> um, but as many Then you people, don't have implications. You don't have projections. Exactly. You're not using those brilliant scientific minds and knowledge and experience and the data to interpret the data because we can't just interpret the dry data on our own. We're not, you know, binary thinking robots. So I always had a trouble, had trouble with this where people would say, you know, mathematics, you know, defines uh, the, you know, the scientific world. I'm like, how do you define consciousness with math? <laughs> I mean, that's how, but it, this really boils down to the, the arguments about qualitative versus quantitative is quantitative it might be able to, um, you might be able to give a mathematical formula for something that's red, but what about how red something is versus something else? The, the, the amount of redness a, a thing is, that is, that's a qualitative idea. So if you look at two flowers and say, this one's more red than this one, how are you going to show that with math, mathematics, you know, with, with numbers? So. That's, what's what's your pigmentation scale or however? Yeah, I, I don't know how that. you do that. Anyway, so I'm just <laughs> saying I agree with um, Carl Sagan about quantifying if possible, but don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Qualitative information is what makes us human. You know, talk about and and you know when it comes down to it, if you have a certain experience, experience especially the types of experiences that Wendy and I talk about here all the time, which are you know, paranormal, supernatural, whatever. Uh, I, to me, it would be tough to quantify a lot of those. So anyway, let's get to number seven. If there's a chain of argument, every link in the chain must work, including the premise, not just most of them. And I like that idea. So in other words, if you're going to line up a bunch of facts and form a hypothesis, every fact must work. And facts related to the hypothesis that fall outside the mode of the information that are outlying facts, they need to be included as well. So mode being occurring most often. Okay. Yeah. Mode being like, if you're seeing a bunch of facts that kind of, they all go together and then you mm -hmm. got this one thing outside that's just, that's really weird. A lot of scientists would say, well, let's ignore that. It doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. Why are you doing that? <laughs> that's, I, I don't like that because the world is an unusual place and there are every now and then there are cycles that don't make sense. So why? So anyway, that's, that's, that's me. Um, number eight is Occam's razor. And it's hilarious because, um, well, Occam's razor simply described is the simplest and most direct explanation is usually the best. Using a razor to just get right down to the, the germ of truth or the nugget of the idea. So I tried to look up a, a good definition for Occam's razor, and I all I found was paragraphs. <laughs> Ironically, how ironic! Like, yeah, it was like no, there was no Occam's razor definition for Occam's razor. It was ridiculous. So I've always did, thought of it as the simplest explanation is usually the best. Right, would be so, how I would describe Occam's razor. That's exactly what I did. <laughs> so I did all this research on like what there's got to be a no that no. The simplest is the best. That's that's it. And then um, number nine is always ask whether the hy hypothesis can be, at least in principle, falsified. Propositions that are untestable and unfalsifiable are not worth much. So that's that's true. I, you know, I think almost anything can be faked nowadays, especially like, you know, we've got technology now where you can fake um, videos, photoshopping, and there, there's technology now where you can actually um, it's scary if you ever see examples of this where you can take a video of a person's face and you can have them and, and, and then do a voice print of their voice and you can have them saying anything. It, lo it looks real. Um, so, yeah, <laughs> almost anything can, can be faked. Um, but, uh, yeah, let, let me let me just leave it at that. Um, and then finally, this is, this was not mentioned. I don't believe this was mentioned in, in his book, but Carl Sagan had a, 
is known for this famous quote that extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. And I, I like that, you know. So for the people like us who have extraordinary experiences and extra, extraordinary lives, <laughs> we require, I respect that we require um, extraordinary evidence. So absolutely. absolutely. And that's why when someone is sharing and out their story, like having seen a UFO, it, it's just, you know, giving them the room to say, I just don't know what to make of this. And remember, UFOs, unidentified flying object. It's not saying this is an ET alien spacecraft. It's, it's, you have to just understand what, what the abbreviation really means. Right, right. So Wendy, that is um, the gist of what uh, was, you know, well, fantastic. Thanks for leading us through this, Greg. This was just such a great suggestion for a topic. And we would love it if you'd uh, come back and join us again on December 19th for the next Waking Up Spiritually podcast. And join us in our Facebook group, which is Waking Up Spiritually. Just put that into the search um, on Facebook. And as I mentioned, uh, please go to our website, wakingupspiritually.com and click on the broadcasts link and you will see um, and hear all the broadcasts that we've done over the last several years or subscribe to our YouTube channel if that's easier for you. And we so appreciate your rate and review on Apple iTunes or whatever your favorite podcast app is because that just simply helps bring more uh, like-minded people to us so we can all enjoy the conversations together. And visit Greg's uh, website at greg, G -R -E -G -G, Kirk com and look for his book, The Gratitude Curve, on there because it's an amazing book and just read and learn more about what Greg offers. I've had many sessions with him. They are fantastic. You don't have to be in person if you don't live near Greg. Uh, you can be a phone appointment, uh, equally effective, because I think it was Rupert uh, Sheldrake who said it's all in the field. <laughs> <laughs> so it's in that that morphic morphic field and please visit my website at wendyrosewilliams.com you can request a complimentary 15 minute phone appointment with me there and depending when you hear this broadcast uh, this thursday is uh, thanksgiving in the united states so thursday and friday my second book the flow plymouth plantation will be available uh, via amazon for just 99 cents so take a look at it and see if that would be something fun um, to get to read because just so many people associate uh, the early colonials and the pilgrims with Thanksgiving. So I thought, what the heck, let's make it be a, a fun uh, Thanksgiving promotion. So again, thank you for being here. Uh, we know times are challenging. We're here to support you and just uh, thank you for using your discernment and just linking up um, your bright your bright minds with your wonderful hearts and that gut wisdom. We so appreciate all of you. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye-bye.